uh, capacity to detect and to deal with different types of, um, of health emergencies. And infectious diseases, pandemics, are one of those. So we have to maintain the capacity to identify, all right, to detect, to, um, to control uh, these pandemics, and to, to contribute to the global effort to prevent diseases from spreading across the world. So within the Ministry of Health, um, there is an epidemiological, uh, epidemiology department that maintains, uh, we, we monitor on a daily and a weekly basis the occurrence of infectious diseases throughout the island and reports are produced. We also monitor signals from overseas with regards to the emergence of new diseases that can cause um, this very scenario, that can that cause a pandemic. We also have to maintain basic capacities in our health system to be able to isolate individuals who are identified to offer some level of, of treatment because you need, you need capacity to isolate individuals because this is a basic principle uh, that you know, ensures that in, in these individuals are separated from the community and are not a risk to the community, are not, a, a, are not able to spread those diseases. So um, together um, within the Ministry of Health, and um, we, those basic systems were already in existence. Now what we had to do was significantly augment these systems in order to face this new challenge. Now, in addition to the, the ability to conduct surveillance, we had to develop the capacity to identify cases locally. Uh, at the start of this pandemic, we did not have that capacity. Uh, and, and you would understand that this is important because you can only fight something if you, can, if you know what it is. You also need to be able to identify it once it exists in your community so that you can take the, the relevant measures to protect persons uh, you know, from, from acquiring this disease and to prevent persons from spreading. Now, if you remember at the start of this pandemic, things evolved quite quickly. We saw the initial reaction to this pandemic was, uh, it was a, a blunt reaction, one that involved um, curfews and border closures and all of that. Now, just imagine that we did not have the capacity locally to test and identify cases, and we had to send our samples to Trinity for that purpose. That became a significant issue when our borders were shut and airlines were no longer able to fly to Grenada. So then how are we expected to identify a case if we can't test locally and we can't ship samples overseas? So we had to quickly uh, build the local capacity. We had to purchase PCR machines. We had to training. We had to um, acquire consumables. And this is where um, our regional partners were key, um, such as um, PAHO, um, Caribbean Public Health Agency, our local partner, um, St. George's University as well. So we had to quickly um, acquire these capacities to be able to identify those cases locally. In addition, we had to significantly uh, beef up our ability to conduct, to, to isolate cases. Uh, previously, we had, you know, the two isolation rooms in the world, which were not suitable for this type of, 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 of um, disease. So we had to construct facilities. We had to um, put money into retrofitting facilities so that we can house these individuals. So these are just some of the things, because I can go on, because there are many, many individual actions that were taken um, within the Ministry of Health, at the level of the government, to prepare us for this um, situation that, that, that we're facing. And, um, and I, I, I think many of them, many of them have allowed us to be very successful because um, this is evidenced by the fact that 
Grenada was one of the few places in the world that almost 20 months after the onset of this pandemic, we did not have community spread. This is only a recent occurrence. So I'll, I'll, I'll pause there for now. Okay, and let's go across to you, uh, Dr. George. Unprecedented virus attacked the world. Obviously, being uh, someone in the medical profession, you had to jump into action. Uh, you didn't really see this coming. What are some of the things you had to do personally, and of course, within your sector, uh, to begin to address this challenge that we had on hand, or have on hand? Um, so it was it was very challenging. Well, first of all, let me say that um, when we went into uh, pandemic mode, I had recently gotten into this role. So I was just settling in and then boom, we had the pandemic um, affecting Grenada. So we had to quickly, you know, work toward how do we prepare our hospital services for this pandemic. And again, I, I just want to say that, you know, as I said, with teamwork, it makes the dream work because with PAHO, CAFA, St. George's University, persons in the diaspora, and all the members of the Ministry of Health, we were able to put our heads together and come up with a plan on how do we address this in hospital services. Number one, we did not have an isolation unit. So first we were able to set up like two rooms for isolation. And then we realized, well, two rooms won't be enough. And we were able to set up an isolation unit that had nine beds. But then a few months later, we realized that was still not enough. And we were able to do some adjusting within our hospital, and we were able to get up to a maximum of, of 93 beds. But luckily for us, we only had to use like maximum 65. Now, apart from that, when the pandemic just started, we noted that it a whole lot of persons, a whole lot of patients going to the intensive care unit. And we got really, really concerned about that because at that time they were promoting ventilation, ventilation. And, you know, uh, persons were having to be intubated, ventilated, and getting ventil ventilation um, through support. And we know that in our hospital we have a four bed unit. And so if we had to deal with our regular day-to-day -day cases and as well deal with the COVID-19 cases that may need ICU care, we realized that that would have been a problem. So quickly, um, and we have to say thanks to St. George's University, um, they contributed significant, significantly to that, and PAHO as well. So at that point, you know, we got a whole um, set of new ventilators, portable ventilators, as well as the conventional ones. So we were, in terms of ventilators, we went up to about 21 ventilators. From going to just maybe about five ventilators, we went to 21. So in terms of that, we were, we were prepared. We got two new um, portable X-ray units, and that is to be able to identify um, COVID pneumonias in patients on the wards. And that came in very handy at that time as well, because in that case, we were able to dedicate one of these portable units to these um, COVID-19 patients. Um, apart from that, then you have the whole issue of supplies. Do we have enough supplies to, to be able to sustain, right? Because initially starting up, you know, you will have enough, but will we have enough supplies to sustain this, this pandemic? And again, I'm safely able to say now that yes, because throughout our pandemic, we never really went out of supplies. So we had enough PPEs, we had enough you know, of the gongs, the mask, all of the necessary protective gear to protect our staff um, against this, this, this virus. All right. And then, of course, the human resource. Um, we had to make sure that we train up our staff on how to effectively don and doff their PPE to minimize risk to themselves. And, of course, our staff really did a, a good job at it um, in terms of the training, and so that was conducted in the early. Right. Our lab never did are testing before and of course quickly we had to get our lab staff trained up we got the new equipment and all the supplies and so with the assistance of PAHO and we quickly trained up our staff we got the equipment and then we were able to start our PCR testing locally 
just about four to five months after the actual first case was announced in Grenada. So we really did a lot. Um, you, you within our about... hospital services, again, you know, you have the whole issue, issue of Karaku and Piti Matnik. So we also had to, to consider how do we address cases where a patient uh, off-island needs to come down to Grenada for service. And so multiple meetings with stakeholders took place. And of course, we, we, we came to a common um, understanding of, you know, who was going to assist in transferring cases. Um, the Coast Guard got involved. And, you know, it was really, really good, good teamwork. I mean, all the hospitals had to prepare for ramping up their surveillance at the accidents and emergencies. Make sure we have available test kits available for testing of persons on arrival and doing PCR testing as well. So it was a lot of preparation, a lot of preparation, but thankfully to good teamwork and good communication among us, we were able to, to get this far. Of course, um, the, our first real wave, as we call it, between August to October, it was even more challenging from when we started because we just saw the numbers rising and rising and rising. But we were able to quickly make adjustments and came up to a capacity of 93 beds, but luckily only had to use 65. Um, so we were happy that, you know, we didn't have to, to go up to the maximum. All right. So these are some of the things we had to do. You, you talk about Powell's, Powell's uh, intervention and how they came on board to, to help uh, with this very critical time. You also talk about uh, St. George's University. Tell us a little bit more, seeing that it is in fact a local entity. How did St. George's University jump in and what specific roles did they play? Right. So, firstly, uh, St. George's University has been a partner, uh, has been a, a partner, you know, contributing to many, many, many aspects of our outbreak, from testing to um, providing uh, individuals assisting on the ground to it's a whole host of things now one of the most significant being that in Grenada was one of the one of the first islands to start doing pcr testing locally all right and persons may not know this but we started doing this pcr testing at the sgu uh, sgu um lab all right, we started out first at the, at the SGU, um, SGU um, vet lab where the PCR machines were located. Now, all of these tests were being conducted, and, and it was quite a large number of tests, were being conducted by um, our SGU staff. All right, SGU staff at no expense to the government of Grenada. Right, so the first was in the area of assisting us with developing that capacity to conduct testing, all right, and developing that capacity very early, all right. It was around early April when we were able to start doing our first PCR tests here locally. Now, in addition, the team at SGU has been with us at every step of the way, all right. They have been assisting in the field, in, they've been assisting with contact tracing, they've been assisting with um, sample collection, all right, going out even to homes and collecting sample collection. They've been assisting with vaccination, all right? They've been assisting with training, all right? Training of individuals, um, purchase of supplies, um, talking, we're talking PPEs, we're talking um, um, lab equipment, we're talking um, test kits, all right? And it's many, 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 many. Um, they've always been there, all right, all right? You can always, if you're in a jam, all right? If our lab is in a jam and we are unable to process the large volume of samples that, uh, that, that were arriving for processing, we can simply make a call to SGU and SGU would reach out to their staff and they would quickly put a team together and we would send the loads of samples over. And, you know, within a day, we would, we would have the results. 
So it's, I mean, it's many, many, uh, I mean, many, many uh, areas in which they have, they have really, really um, been uh, one of our most valuable partners in this whole um, experience. Okay, Dr. Donald, I'm gonna come right back to you. Uh, how equipped are we now? Because uh, the cases have risen quite a lot, of course, from around last August, September. How e equipped are we now in regards to, let's say, ventilators, oxygen, other very important facilities? And by extension, just bring us up to speed a little bit as to how our local medical stations, for example, would play any significant role? Okay, so in terms of um, our preparation right now, um, now I have to say that as a result of the pandemic, uh, as a result of the pandemic, this has significantly helped us to improve our uh, capacity, capability, and and the amount of equipment that we have in hospital services. Um, because from let's say March last year to now. We've gotten quite a number of equipment, as I said, starting from portable x-rays, ventilators. Um, we even recently got um, what we call high-flow nasal cannulas, I mean, which is something that not many islands have. And we're proud to say now that we have five of these devices which help to take care of patients with severe COVID pneumonia. So in terms of, of are we prepared now, we are way better prepared now than we were, let's say, a few months ago. and. So as I said, we never had any issues in terms of running out of, of supplies. We have equipment on, on the ground to take care of our patients. Only recently from the government of China, we, we got these donations of the high flu nasal cannulas along with pumps, IV pumps, um, infusion pumps, we call them, and syringe pumps. So this is to even further boost our capability. Now, one of the things we noted with COVID-19 is that you always try at all costs to avoid having to give um, a person mechanical ventilation, which is connect, connecting a patient to a machine um, to assist them with breathing through intubation. And it's one of the things we've noted that when persons get intubated, the prognosis generally is poor. So you try at all costs to use all the non-invasive forms of ventilation. Right now, in terms of how equipped we are to do that, we are in a much better place than we were a few months ago because with the high flow nasal cannulas, um, now we can use that step before going to mechanical ventilation. And so the prognosis would be much better for, for the patients. And we have five of these um, devices. As I said, this is not something that most islands have. So again, Grenada really has done well in terms of being able to secure these um, devices to assist persons with breathing. Uh, in terms of um, our supplies, we, as I said, we never run out of supplies. and. Again, we want to say that through the diaspora, because when we had that last wave, our, our first main wave, we got a lot of support from the diaspora. That diaspora group, they provided a lot of medication, a lot of supplies, including um, protective gear. And they sent them, they were coming in droves. Actually, we're still receiving donations from persons in the diaspora. And for that, again, we're really grateful and we want to say thank you to them. Because because of them, we have over a million masks in stock um, to care for, to help care for our patients, for our staff, and to care for patients both in community and at the hospital. Now, with regards with community, now everything starts in community, you know. So we always they they're like the pillar of the the whole health system. And what happens in community is that this is generally the first point at which the patient would go. The patient would go to community. When they get ill, generally that would be their first stop. And then sometimes after being assessed, they might be able to stay at home and the community nurses and community physicians or the district medical officers will follow up on these patients at home. And at times, well, during that follow-up, when these patients become more severe, then these patients are then transferred to the hospital services and at our various hospitals. So community has... Uh, a very significant role in this whole pandemic. Um, they've been doing most of the surveillance, the testing. So when you see, for example, um, let's say a thousand tests conducted, most times it's 900 and let's say 50 might be done in community. 
right? A hospital, we focus more on taking care of the patients and they're the ones doing most of the surveillance and following up all the patients at home, um, particularly patients with the underlying condition. So our community team, I mean, thumbs up for them. They've done a good job, very, very excellent job. They've worked very, very hard and they continue to do so. Because as I said, they're the, the first point of contact with the patient. That's where most persons go for testing, go for vaccination, go for that first. When I feel sick, the first place you tend to go would be a community clinic. And then, of course, based on the severity, you're then referred to hospital. So it's, as I said, it's teamwork, community and hospital services. We work together to ensure that the patients have the best outcome. Yes, we've got uh, Dr. Charles and of course Donna, Donna here on the program. We're going to take a quick break. We've got lots in store ahead and then we'll be right back. As you're collecting some data. How did you get your electricity bill to be so low? For one, we size our transformers just for what we need. And we unplug transformers, chargers, and other devices when they're not in use. We also replaced our light bulbs with LED. I even replaced the seal on my refrigerator door to keep the cold air in. How do you know if it is working? We pay attention to the usage history table. Over time, our average usage has decreased. Grenlink, energizing our Grenada. Just a reminder, the global pandemic is not over. Office pros and workers are still here to protect you. Available are several versions of touchless hand sanitizer and hand soap dispensers, dispenser stands, paper towel and toilet paper dispensers, and thermometers. Also available, hand sanitizing gel, sanitizing solution, hand soap, Lysol products, face masks, and gloves, all offered at the best price on the market and backed by a full warranty and protection plan with free installation. We are located on the Woodlands Main Road. Call Office Pros on 444-2393 or Markers on 439-2393. You can also visit the Facebook page for more information. And never forget to remember, I, Mr. Markers, would never forsake you. Believe that. Introducing Color by Sissons. Color by Sissons. For we are your Santa this Christmas. Offer ends January 31st, 2022. Lending terms and conditions apply. Have you heard about the new soft weave bathroom tissue with Total Hygiene? As hygiene and safety have taken center stage, a bathroom tissue is now manufactured with three different technologies to offer the best protection for you and your family. UVC light technology for a safe and effective disinfection process, eliminating 99.9% .9 of microorganisms. Also, production at high temperatures, killing all types of germs and bacteria. And it's pH controlled with delicate fibers to prevent irritation for even sensitive skin. Soft weave total high Hygiene bathroom tissue available in supermarkets and shops island wide. Visit Soft Weave Caribbean Facebook or Instagram pages for more information. And 
welcome back. Now, let me just quickly go across to Dr. Sean Charles. Uh, Dr. Charles, we don't know what the future holds, but more likely we may see other pandemics uh, hitting down on the globe. In regards to Grenada, what I would like to quickly ask, and maybe you can give a quick response, would there be need for quarantine stations? Now, back then, of course, we had leprosy in Grenada, and the old-fashioned quarantine point was used as one of those stations. Will there be a dire need for quarantine facilities in Grenada in the future? Um, very good question. Um, even before I answer that question, I wanted to, to, to um, just add one point to how prepared are we. Uh, and something that cannot be overlooked is the experience. I think over these two years, we have gained a tremendous amount of, of, of experience uh, with handling this pandemic. As I remember, um, at the outset, everyone was so frightened. And um, it really, it really um, affected our efforts to respond in a more rational manner. And I think now with the experience that we've gained um, from, you know, dealing with this pandemic over time, um, it puts us in a much better position to, to handling this, um, this disease, in addition to all the resources and so on that we have. Now, with regards to quarantine, now, quarantine is... Uh, it's, it, it, it is an intervention that is taken when someone is exposed to a disease and we do not yet know whether that person will, uh, will test positive. So someone had a high-risk exposure to a disease. This individual is quarantined and monitored to see if they develop the disease. All right, if they did not, all right, which is proven by doing a test after a certain period of time, then that individual is allowed to continue their normal activity. Um, there will always be a need for quarantine because, I mean, it doesn't just apply to COVID, it also applies to other infectious diseases, all right? And it is a standard um, infection control measure that is taken anywhere. So there will always be the need for uh, to quarantine individuals, and there would always be the need to find somewhere to quarantine to to, to house these individuals. And this is basically a, 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 a site where that individuals can be kept safely away from the population while they are being monitored. Right. So the answer is yes. We will continue to need facilities for quarantine, and we will continue, in addition, to need facilities for isolation for persons who also test positive. Yeah, but it must be a pretty tough assignment, and it must be a pretty challenging and maybe in some cases worrying experience for the Ministry of Health and those who are involved in the health sector, uh, of course, here, where you have uh, individuals who may have contacted, uh, contracted the disease or the virus or any other um, viral attack, so to speak, and they're home with a family of nine, two-bedroom houses, and house, and they really don't have anywhere else they can go. Their aunt's place is equally crowded. Um, how challenging is, is that for the community and also for the health sector? What do you do when you experience those sort of cases? You want people to isolate, but they've got absolutely nowhere to go. Yeah. All right. So let me say, Either say that. You can, you can go after it. So let me just say that scenario is a very challenging one. All right, it's a very, very challenging, and it is a scenario that 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 has played out, um, that, or that is playing out um, across across the island, and that is why all of the interventions that we implement to control this disease 
is considered to be one layer of the overall series of interventions that are needed to control the disease. So first and foremost, right, our, our aim and our goal is to ensure that persons do not become infected in the first place. And that is why we recommend all of the prevention measures, all right, the wearing of the mask, sanitizing, avoiding risky scenarios, risky crowd scenarios, all right, all of these, and of course, distancing. Now, when individuals do become infected, right, the ideal, the ideal scenario will be to have some location where you can extract that person from that medium, especially that challenging um, family, family setting that you mentioned, place them. But in reality, we do not have such a facility. All right? We do not have such a facility. However, there are guidelines for safely managing a person at home or safely quarantining persons at home, right? And we also provide um, these, these guidelines. The individuals would have to take additional precautions. They will have to now wear the mask even while they are at home. They will have to make conscious effort to avoid uh, spreading infection to other persons in the in their family set, all right? And it takes conscious effort to do that, all right? They have to sanitize. They have to do as much as possible to avoid infection spread. But of course, there are scenarios where, you know, this, in, this itself is challenging. When you do encounter some scenarios when there are multiple individuals um, at a particular dwelling, where there is presence of infection, then the next step up is to quarantine that entire family in the, in the home. Because, because of the nature of this disease and the fact that it is spread very, very easily in the household setting, the next um, step in the intervention is to quarantine that entire family in the home to prevent them um, spreading the disease to the rest of the community. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Charles. We're going to jump into something that, uh, at least over the last few months, has become quite a bit of a, a talk about, and that is the booster. That's the booster. Um, people are now saying you need that added, uh, that added level of protection from COVID-19. Now, tell us a little bit here, Dr. Donald, about this uh, booster shot, exactly what it is and how important this is. Okay, so when we speak of booster shot, we're speaking about trying to improve our immunity, building up our, our, our ability to fight against the COVID-19 um, virus. So what, I mean, according to the data that, that's out there and according to you know what's been happening in, in other places, even in Grenada, what has been noted is that after a certain amount of time um, beyond your second dose in the cases where your, your vaccination, the vaccine is a two-dose schedule, um, what is noted is that after a few months, in some cases, um, some places um, speak of four to six months, they notice that the amount of antibodies in your body to protect you against this virus will decrease and as a result of that your ability to fight that virus becomes a, a, a bit less so what does the booster shot do? the booster shot basically is another dose of that vaccine and what it does is it helps to build back up your antibodies so that when faced with the virus you're better able to fight and i know persons some persons who you know have been doing research on covid 19 may have remembered with, with Israel, where um, they had quite a large percentage of the population vaccinated, but after a few months, they had like this big outbreak 
And what they realized, it was because at that point, when they did antibody testing on, on, on some of their, their patients, they realized that the antibody levels were, were low. And so doing the booster shot, what it does, it improves your immunity, it improves your ability to fight. And so it is something that's recommended. And it's recommended particularly for persons who, you know, have underlying issues, pregnant women, um, the immunocompromised persons. These are persons who are at risk of developing severe disease. And so these are persons who really, really, really should have a booster shot because they want to protect themselves against having, you know, severe COVID-19 disease. So the booster shot is to improve your, your ability to fight this virus. And hence, you know, is something that's promoted. So for example, in, in, in our setting, we use the AstraZeneca vaccine, the Pfizer and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And we recommend, of course, based on studies, and so we also recommend that when doing booster shots, you try to, to do a mix. And again, that is to help, you know, improve your level of immunity to fight against disease. So is it something that we should do? Yes. Persons who have underlying issues, should you do a booster shot? Well, you should do it even more so than persons who have no underlying conditions. Should pregnant women do booster shots? Yes. So, you know, I know it's, a, it's an area where there's a lot of questions. Um, do we recommend booster shots at our at Ministry of Health, Grenada? Yes. So let me ask further to this. Will there possibly be, a, 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 not, just be on a, not just a third, but a fourth, a fifth, a sixth um, booster shot? Or will there be some sort of long-term memory immunity after the third shot, so to speak? Any one of you can advise me on this or just illuminate us. Right, so maybe I can maybe I can take this one. So there's a lot that we do not know at, at this time. It is possible that you may need to have a yearly shot similar to the influenza. All right, or it may not be that frequently. All right, um, there's a lot that. As I say, that we we um, we do not know and we cannot answer right now. What um, is apparent is that the immunity um, following following vaccination wins um, in some individuals, especially um, persons with underlying health problems that may weaken their immune systems. And it is recommended that they get a booster to you know, to prime, to further prime their immune systems so that in the event that they face the, you know, they, they become infected, they will not have um, severe disease, right? So like I said, there's, a, there's, there's some things that we do, not, uh, we do not know yet. Okay, so Dr. Donald, tell us, you've got your first shot, you've got your second shot, and then there is the booster shot. What's the difference in regards to the composition of the vaccines, the difference between the first and the second, and the, the third, which is the booster shot, shot? Is there any differences involved? So the composition, the basic composition of the booster shot is, is the same. Um, we have different vaccines that have, you know, different um, protocols that go with them. But the basic composition is actually the same. Um, there is one of the vaccines that have, of course, the, the booster shot is a lower dosage than the, the regular shots, um, but the composition itself is the same. So some persons get a little confused with the whole concept of booster shot. And so sometimes I try to tell them, you know, think of it like a, a third dose. Yes, so think of it as a third dose. And... It, it's, it's a dose to help build back up the immunity after it would have, you know, dropped over a few months. So yeah, consider it a third dose to understand it better. So some persons think that the composition is actually different. No, it's not a different composition. It's actually the same composition. Um, it's just that it's a third dose that has, you know, 
that is, is designed to help improve and, and increase your, your antibodies that could help you to face um, the virus, you know, in a, in a much stronger way and so help you to prevent um, yourself from developing severe COVID-19 illness or severe COVID-19 pneumonia. And, and is it critical to herd immunity? Um, is, it, is it really critical to herd immunity or not? How critical is it? How important? How significant? Or not really? All right. So well, let me go ahead, Dr. Charles. Go ahead, Dr. Yeah. Dr. Charles. Right. So, yeah. Let me let me first say that the 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 aim of the vaccine is to prevent persons from becoming seriously ill, to prevent hospitalization, and even more severe um, uh, complications um, leading leading to death. All right, so this is the aim of the vaccine. Now, with regards to herd immunity, um, from from what we've from what we've observed, um, it is difficult to to determine at what level uh, is required to achieve such a herd immunity, because we are dealing with a virus that changes very frequently and we see the emergence of strains of that virus that are even more transmissible even more easily spread from person to person and can even affect persons who have been vaccinated as well all right so the concept of herd immunity here it's very difficult to define with regards to covid However, the core purpose of the vaccine as preventing severe disease and, and um, other severe complications, what is most important here? Okay, L let's just skip along to vaccine hesitancy. And I think most people uh, on the front line in regards to health would obviously be concerned about that. And I just had a, a bit of a note in front of me early on today, and I took note of it, that said vaccine hesitancy survey carried out in October, November uh, by Caribbean Development Research Services. Grenada was the second least vaccine hesitant country uh, that's in the Caribbean area. I think there were six countries uh, the research was done with in 2021. What does that really say? that sort of statistic is does that bring a smile on your face no <laughs> well no not really it, it simply it makes, makes us sad <laughs> yeah it makes us sad because we understand the situation we have and it simply means that it's not just limited to us it's it's a region-wide issue this vaccine hesitancy it took quite a lot for people to respond to the call to be vaccinated. People really were very hesitant, and I dare say they're still rather hesitant about it here in Grenada. Now, do you think there are any particular reasons or reasons for that? Is there anything culturally associated, anything medically associated? Are people just generally skeptical here in Grenada? What, in your opinion, I guess going around feeling out people, uh, Dr. Donald, may be some of the reasons for that hesitancy. So I'll speak um, as one. Let me start like as a, as a pediatrician. So as a pediatrician, you know, one of the main things that we do is to ensure vaccination for our children. And of course, over the years, you know, um, we've been seeing a decrease in the number of you know, well, an increase in the number of persons who prefer not to vaccinate their kids. So a decrease in our general uptake in the, in the country. Now, some of the reasons are one, um, because of uh, social media, you have a group of anti-vaxxers out there and they really do promote, um, you, know, the re you know, different reasons why you should not be vaccinated. And persons go, they read and, and you know, they believe in what, what these persons say and and they decide not to become vaccinated. Um, two, um, some persons, because of religious reasons, do not get vaccinated. Um, in terms of COVID-19 vaccine, uh, there's the issue of persons being unsure um, 
as to what exactly is in the vaccine. So persons are unsure of what is in the vaccine and so they don't feel comfortable taking the vaccine. Um, then you have um, the group of persons who think that the vaccine was developed very, very quickly. And, and they're saying, well, for this thing to be developed so quick, then, you know, it, it, it can, it can be, be too good, you know? And then there are other persons who would hear their friends or colleagues who would have taken the vaccine and who may have had some side effects, which are common in, in vaccines, even in children, because whenever I administer a vaccine to a child, I always inform the parents within 72 hours of receiving the vaccine, you can expect to have a little fever, crankiness, maybe decreasing in, in appetite, which is a, the common side effects of vaccines. But persons may hear that their friend or so had these symptoms and they get afraid, you know, they say, well, you know, it seems like this thing is making you sick. Um, you know, not, not understanding that this is like regular um, effects of what we call it the post-vaccine syndrome. You know? So you get these things after vaccines and it's a common, a, a common occurrence. And then there are other persons who hear of, of course, you know, we have the tendency sometimes to, to, to look at the worst case scenario. So there are the, the rare but severe side effects of different vaccines. Uh, for example, um, one of them affects the heart. Then you have the whole issue with the blood clots. And so some persons, despite all the mild symptoms that you can have following the vaccine, they are really scared about these severe um, adverse um, effects of the vaccine. And because of that, they choose not to, not to take it. I mean, and then a lot of persons go with a lot of myths, you know. So, you know, rather than do your proper research in, 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 a, in an area where you get, you know, Proper information, for example, World Health Organization, CDC, uh, Ministry of Health web, web, website or Facebook page. Um, sometimes they opt to go for, you know, sometimes what their friends say, um, what they see on social media, which may not always be correct. So information is so important, you know. So we have this whole issue with, you know, social media. There's a lot of information out there. And sometimes we choose the information that's, that's not the correct one. Um, you know, without even verifying it, maybe with persons who can actually give you an idea of you know, it has been said. So there's a lot of reasons why, you know, persons opt not to be vaccinated and contribute, of course, to vaccine hesitancy. Um, and we, we're still trying to work on, on how we can improve that. But um, we, we, we continue to try and we, we can't give up, um, but it, it's a real problem. It is a real problem and it's something we have to continuously work, work um, against, you know. Good. The health sector coping with COVID. That's our subject matter this evening. Take a, a short break, but I just want to alert to viewers and listeners that in our last segment, we'll be opening up the line so that we hear a bit from you. We'll be right back. a product that helped with the cold, flu, bronchitis, sinusitis, laryngitis, and allergies, and still does deep cleansing for your pores to restore natural beauty, would you get it? Yes? Well, there is. The two-in-one facial and nasal steamer is here, and it's available locally at The Boss Collection. The two-in-one facial and nasal steamer provides deep cleansing while clearing nasal passages and loosening impurities. Get yours now from The Boss Collection. Booth number six on Halifax Street, St. George's, opposite Farm and Garden Center, or in Grenville by Rachel the Nail Tech, upstairs Superstore, opposite Peter's Photo Studio. Call or WhatsApp the Boss Collection on 954 600 0200. Here is a little known fact. 
there is only one place in Grenada that you can get an MRI scan done. That place is Spicile Imaging Center. Yes, Grenada, that's the truth. Other centers could offer you other scans, but Spy Cell Imaging provides an authentic MRI scan. Here's another little known fact. Spy Cell Imaging has three centers. We operate at Grenville, the Carnage, and at the Ocean House Grand Dance. We provide the widest range of laboratory tests and services. CT scans, x-rays, mammograms, ultrasounds, and a host of other services. We are fully staffed by a team of family doctors and specialists. Call us today at 444-7679 or 406-1500 or visit any of our three locations. Spice and Imaging, from seeing the doctor to getting lab tests, scans, and pharmacy services. We are here to take care of you. You have been waiting on it all year. Now, it's your chance to make this Christmas better than ever. Get the extra cash you need with a Make This Christmas Better loan from the GUT Credit Union. Get up to $50,000 to celebrate your Christmas and make your holiday dreams come true. Home improvements, new furniture, a vehicle, debt consolidation, or even a vacation. We can help you get there. Yes, you can. Make this Christmas better with the GUT Credit Union. It's where you belong. Are you looking for quality herbs and herbal supplements? Or are you thinking about having a complete body cleanse to jumpstart your health? Then no need to look further. Visit Nirvana Natural Health Clinic Detox Center and Natural Health Store. We carry a wide range of herbal products for kidney and gallstone cleansing, male sexual enhancement formulas, asthma and sinusitis, gas and bloating, acid reflux, constipation, arthritis, imbalance hormones, female health issues, liver cleansing, weight loss, and so much more. Also available, colonic irrigation, holistic health consultations, essential oils, and diffusers. Look out for our online natural health store coming soon. Call 231-6642-418-7115 or 449 To find out about our delivery options or to book an appointment, visit us at Belmont St. George's, close to the Forledge, Monday to Saturday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Nirvana Natural Health Clinic. Detox your way to health. It's the most wonderful time of the year for deals and bargains galore at Mitch and Pearl Enterprise. We stock wines, rums, pots and pans, chocolates, ornaments, and all your decor for the season. We even carry fine chinaware and a wide assortment of cups, plates and mugs. Additionally, we have a good stock of top quality household appliances. At Mitch and Pearl, we are keen in fashion. Check out our high fashion sunglasses and delicate pieces of bracelets and necklaces. And not forget the children. We have the latest in dolls, puzzles, gift sets, and other fun fill items. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, and even medication. So for this holiday season, visit Mitch and Pearl Enterprise on the Mount Parnassus Main Road for deals, deals, and more deals. Call us at telephone number 435-0997 or 535-1364. Get Ruby Gas. Get cooking. Ruby Gas. Clean, safe, and reliable LPG is the perfect solution for your commercial and everyday needs. For cooking at home or barbecuing, choose Ruby Gas LPG cylinders. Available in a variety of sizes from 20 to 100 pound cylinders. Ruby Gas LPG. Clean, safe, reliable. Are you cooking with Ruby Gas? Get Rubis. Get going. We often take mobility for granted. 
that is why at the Grenada Physiotherapy Limited, we look after our patients' holistic well-being. We assess and treat from the simplest to the most complex complaints. Treating injury is not our only focus. We have a passionate team and a wide array of practitioners working together to assist you through that rehabilitation process. We offer a wide range of services, speech massage and physiotherapy, weight management, cardiac rehabilitation and much more. Call and make an appointment today, 435-8000 or visit us downstairs the National Cricket Stadium, gate 101-1. 115. The health set sector coping with COVID-19. And uh, we've got, of course, here this evening on our program, two very efficient and important individuals uh, in doctors. Sean Charles and Tahisha Donnell. So here, here's what now, we're gonna just move into another troublemaker, another variant that is on hand, Omicron. Can you enlighten us on this? It is in fact causing quite a bit of concern and we're talking about one variant into another and it is a huge concern on the part of everybody. Now, how different is this variant from the Delta variant, for example? Dr. Charles, could you help us here? All right. So, folks would remember that in starting late August, and I think um, extending for maybe about eight weeks or so, we were affected by the Delta variant. At the time, it was the most um, severe strain, the most virulent strain that was circulating in the, in the world. Unfortunately, it happened to be our first, uh, our first wave. And of course, you know, it caused uh, quite a bit of, of uh, heartache for us here in Grenada. Now, what we, what we knew, because since after developing community spread um, caused by Delta, and after that, that, that wave, that initial surge of cases subsided, we knew that for Grenada to experience another um, significant wave, it would have to be with a variant or uh, with a strain of the virus that is even more contagious than Delta. So when we learned about the emergence or the discovery of the Omicron variant um, somewhere in, in, in South Africa in the first half of, um, 20, of November 2021, then we knew that, uh, yeah, this could, be, this could very well be the cause of our second wave. Now, Omicron, it uh, has been shown to be uh, many times more contagious, or many times more easier to spread from person to person than Delta variant. Um, I've heard um, talks of it being up to 300% more contagious or, or, or spread uh, as compared to the Delta variant. Uh, this is because it was observed to have a large number of, large number of mutations that you know, caused quite a bit of concern because at the time, you know, even the scientists didn't understand fully what this virus was capable of. They knew it was spreading faster than anything they've ever seen before. But the, uh, you know, confirmation of how, just how deadly or how severe it, it was going to be was still pending. So, but, or should I say, um, thankfully, all right, what has emerged so far is that yes, while this disease is highly contagious, it has so far not been as severe as the Delta variant. Now, that does not mean that 
it is not a serious virus because the mere fact that it spreads very easily and it can make large numbers of persons sick, uh, this in itself can put some pressure on any health system. So in, on the 29th of December, 2021, Grenada identified it's the first group of, of Omicron cases. Now, mind you, this in itself was a bittersweet moment for us because one, this was the first uh, run of our new sequencer. All right. We had recently acquired the capacity to do whole genome sequencing here in Grenada. And this was our first run. And in our first run, we identified. 11 cases, and these 11 cases were among individuals who did not travel. So that was the 29th of December. And subsequent runs, we've had a, a subsequent run on the 11th of January, where we identified another 19 cases of the Omicron, um, which confirms that we have community spread of Omicron in Grenada right now. So far, all right, so far, the disease has not overwhelmed our hospitals. All right, meaning that we have not seen a large number of persons needing admissions. Generally, persons with a flu like illness that might include a sore throat, um, sneezing, runny nose, headache, fever, you know, maybe some aches and pains, and so on. But we have not seen a huge rise in number of severe cases needing hospitalization. However, there has been a huge increase in the demand for testing, right? So whereas we are not seeing lots of admissions, we are seeing a huge demand for testing at all of our clinics. And that in itself is putting some stress and some strain on, on the system. But we, like I said before, we remain cautiously optimistic that the pattern that we are, that we are seeing uh, will continue and will subside in a, few, in, in, in a few days, all right? But we, we still remain um, cautious because we know that we have a large proportion of the population that is not vaccinated and that, it's a, that is at risk of disease from any strain of the, of the virus. Could you give us an idea of the status of the Delta variant? Omicron is here, uh, we've got Delta still here. Has it subsided a bit, uh, Dr. Charles, as vicious as ever? All right, so that is a very good question. Um, what I can I can say with certainty is that our detection of a Delta strain was in December 2021. So very recently, as of last month, we detected a case of Delta. Uh, all right. Um, we have not detected another since then from our sequencing, but we continue to monitor. All right. However, we do believe that there is some level of the Delta variant still circulating uh, on the island. Uh, we know that Omicron will eventually uh, be the dominant strain here in Grenada, just as it's doing right across the world. But we do believe that there may still be um, a few cases of Delta that are lingering. Okay, listeners and viewers, the, the number to call 440 one two five two four four zero one two five two. So if you want to call and shoot a question at uh, any of the doctors, you can do so. I'm sure that you've got some burning issues and questions out there that you'd want some clarification. We've got our first call on the line. Call or go right ahead, please, would you? Yes, good evening. Both to both and to the guests or the participants there. A question was thrown out, Mr. Worm, to the doctors, re the quote-unquote booster shot. 
But I wasn't very clear in the responses. I think what is of interest to the people is the following. Is the booster shot of a equal dosage or intensity, if we may say, B, lesser dosage or intensity, or greater dosage or intensity as compared to the, should we say, the principal dosages given by the one or two shots prior? Thank you very much and have a nice evening, will you? Thank you very much, Citizen Rolo. Our doctors are on hand. They will clarify. Well, maybe I can say that the booster is identical, identical to the previous shot. It's a, it's a third dose for those who receive, who took vaccines that uh, the primary um, schedule is uh, are two doses. So if you were vaccinated with AstraZeneca, it's a third dose. If you were vaccinated with, with, with Pfizer, it's a third dose. If you were vaccinated with Johnson & Johnson, then it would be a second dose after the Johnson & Johnson. So it is identical to the previous shots that you have received. All right, we've got another caller. Caller, thanks for holding. Go right ahead, please. Hello? Let's go right ahead, caller. Yes, good night, Pastor Wama, and to the doctors. <coughs> this question is to Dr. Sean. I have often heard Dr. Sean Charles said time and time on the program, or on the radio, that if you are... If you are, uh, let's say you come down with this, you are showing sign of the symptoms, which is sneezing, coughing, to throat, running nose, fever. Do not come to the health center or to the hospital or ride buses. I want to find out now, why if somebody come down with the symptoms, or they think they have the symptoms, and they call the health center, the people at the health center tell them they have to come to the, the health center. And I could verify that the three persons I know called the health center. It was earlier this morning. Lily had been sick for a week. She called the, the, um, the health center. All they tell her she have to come to the health center. So this morning, Lily really leave all in Mount Rodney to go to the health center in La Fortune. You know how much people she could be infected? Why is that so? Please let me know. Thank you. It's yours, Dr. Charles. Right. So that is a that is actually a very good question, and I and I, I know it will clarify a lot of um, doubts for the persons who are listening. Now, uh, as we continue to uh, respond to the pandemic, our approach to the response has evolved as well. So in the past, our approach were if you have flu-like symptoms, all right, you stay at home, you reach out to your nearest health facility, we arrange to come out and, and, um, and, test, and test you. Now, the challenge that we are faced with at this time is that we are dealing with a strain of the, of, of, of the virus that can spread very easily, yes. But in addition, the number of persons, as I mentioned, um, that are coming for testing have significantly increased. And the number of staff members that we have to conduct the testing is less than we had, um, let's say, in our, in our last wave. So at this juncture, it is not practical for us to visit the home of individuals uh, you, you know, on a routine basis to conduct testing. What we, what we do advise, because now, in addition, we do know what measures that persons can take to prevent transmission. All right? So our recommendation is that the individuals 
ensure that they wear their mask properly, all right, that they sanitize, that they come to one of our testing sites that we have. And we try to, to, to ensure that testing sites are as close to persons um, in their districts as possible, right? So in every district, um, persons can access a test. You, don't, you no longer need to travel all the way from St. Andrews to St. George in order to access a test. But what we do advise is that persons, all right, if you're experiencing symptoms, all right, if you are exposed to a case, uh, at least five days prior, you come out to one of our testing sites and you get testing. You get tested. All right, you find out your status. If you are positive, we provide you with orientation, what you need to do, all right, in order to ensure that you do not spread disease to others. Because remember, we have been preaching on about the the, the different measures that persons need to take in order to prevent the spread of disease okay. for some time. And we, Dr. we, Dr. we Charles, I'm going to, that by, I'm going to interview. We hope that by now, persons would have, would have, would have learned. All right. So, sorry about that, but we've got a caller who's been waiting for quite a bit. So let's entertain the caller. Caller, go right ahead. And thanks for holding. Sorry about that, but we've got a caller who's been... Hello? Yes, go right ahead, caller. Yes, good, good evening to the panel, good evening to Dr. Charles and uh, um, Mr. Worm and the young lady. Um, I think we Grenadians, now the Bible says anybody who cannot think for themselves is a fool. And we have a lot of people in Grenada like that. Now, if you look at the amount of people that is vaccinated and living, Look at how much die. 200 and something out of the people that took the vaccine, about 10 died because they had a lot of complaints that, that raise up, you know, when, when you have the COVID, whatever complaint you had there before, it comes to the surface. So they had a lot of that and they died. But taking the vaccine will keep you from getting very sick. No, I'm 73 years, okay? I put my faith and trust in God. I fear God with all my heart and soul. And I took the vaccine. My conscience tell me I had to take the vaccine. I got COVID on the 2nd or the 3rd of September. I knew I had it because somebody in the house had it. I started to get a little pain on my chest, a little coughing, and a slight fever. Um, one of the ladies came and tested me on the 6th of September, and she said I had COVID, but I, had, I stayed home from the third and never went go outside until the 28th of September because I didn't even go to church. I had church nice, but I stay away from church. Okay, and I just sailed through the COVID. I had nothing major. I could have laughed at COVID and say COVID, I thought she was bad because I put my trust in God and I took the vaccine. So tonight I, I tell in every Grenadian, put your faith in the Lord and take the vaccine. Thank you. Right, that's, that's counsel, doctors, from a 73-year-old man. Yes. And, and just to support him there, Pastor Rome, um, I just want to support him because uh, even right now, what we've seen, we have presently uh, seven patients admitted with um, COVID pneumonia or COVID-related illness. And of that seven, we only have one person who is fully vaccinated and one person partially vaccinated. And the five other patients are not vaccinated. And of them, one is, is, is severely ill. So, you know, it really does, you know, correspond and relate to what this gentleman is saying. So the data speaks for itself, actually, because this is the same type of data we've seen in that first rail wave, and it's a similar pattern that we're seeing right now. 
Come on. Okay, great. Well, tell you what, we're going to take our last caller uh, for tonight's program. Caller, go right ahead. Thanks for, okay, for holding. I can go ahead? Yes, please. Yes, so I would like to ask Dr. Charles a question, please. Can I? Go right ahead. Right. No. I am a patient doing surgery in America on my joints in my body. I took four shots in 2021. Can I take the vaccine? The vaccine that they're talking about, can I take the vaccine? Because the doctors in America warn me not to take any medicine to mix with what they are giving me. Can I get a clarification from you, the doctor, what to do? Because I have to go back and get the surgery, and I'm waiting on an answer for the people that are waiting me for I have to go back this year to get four shots again. So I want to know what to do. Could you give me a little clarification, please, Dr. Charles? Thank you, Carla. All right. Uh, that's a very good question. Let me just answer by saying that the only absolute contraindication or the only reason that persons are advised not to take a particular vaccine is if those individuals had a severe allergic reaction to that vaccine. All right, so in that instance, they will be advised not to take, that, to take the vaccine. Or if they have had a severe allergic reaction to a component of the vaccine, then they advise not get the vaccine. For all other individuals, you are actually encouraged to get vaccinated. For persons who have underlying health problems, all right, you have diabetes, you have high blood pressure, you have heart problem, lung, kidney, whichever, you have asthma, you are encouraged to get vaccinated. vaccinated. You should get vaccinated. Right, because these individuals are at increased risk of severe illness. Now, this particular case, uh, I, I, I just want to make the caller aware that you know you may not be able to enter the United States if you are not a national of the United States and you are unvaccinated. So you you need to take that into consideration as well. Um, when you make your preparations for travel, because uh, that is one of the restrictions that uh, they have in place. Thanks. Okay, let's just look at this uh, finally. The Omicron variant that we have now, uh, Dr. Donald, in regards to children, what's our observations so far in terms of children contracting it? Is there some measure of alarm and huge concern around? So in comparison to the, the, that previous wave, uh, we're now seeing that a lot more children have become infected with the COVID-19, um, with that virus. Um, so we're seeing a lot more children. However, what we're seeing is that most of these children, we, we're speaking about babies from as young as nine days old, all the way up, what we're seeing is that they've been presenting with mild disease. And so, so far, you know, we have not had any, any child presenting with um, any COVID pneumonia or any severe disease related to, to, to COVID-19. So all of the kids so far have been presenting with mild disease. And the admissions for, for pediatric patients has been very, very low as well. So, so far, we, we, we're monitoring the trend, and we're hoping that it will continue that way. So, so far, we, we're, not, we're not really seeing any, any severe cases in the pediatric um, patients. Any final thoughts you want to leave with us, uh, respectively? That's uh, Dr. Donald and uh, Dr. Sean Charles. Give us your final thoughts before we wrap up. 
so for, for me, my final thoughts would be that, you know, we're in the midst of pandemic and, um, you know, it's been over a year. And one of the things that I guess one of the, 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 the new thoughts that has to, you know, become a part of all of our minds is the fact that, you know, how do we go forward living with an uh, ongoing pandemic? And how do we do that? One, um, ensuring that we are protected through vaccination. Of course, even before vaccination, we have to ensure that we have healthy living. So, you know, we have to make sure we exercise, make sure we drink enough water, make sure we have balanced diets, make sure for the persons with chronic illness that we have steady follow-ups, all right? Make sure we take our medications, we are compliant with follow-up and medication. And then, of course, ensuring that we are vaccinated. Um, we also want to ensure that we keep in mind that, you know, we are responsible for ourselves. And for whether or not this virus, you know, continues to rage through our country. And one of the, the only way we can do that, apart from through vaccination, is to ensure that we follow our protocols. So ensuring that, you know, even if we in a, a small social activity, because, you know, we advocate that in the midst of the pandemic, you try to avoid large crowds, ensure that when you are in crowds, and even now we're even seeing that even in the household, you have to ensure that you wear your mask as much as you can, but not just wear your mask, but wear it properly. Ensure that you keep your hands sanitized and really and truly trying to stay away from the large crowds. Because, you know, especially in the case of Omicron, it's, it's highly contagious and it spreads really, really quickly. But whether or how it spreads is totally dependent on us. So if we, we get vaccinated, which means that we're more likely to present with mild disease and the chances of spreading would be less. And if we maintain healthy living and if we follow our protocols, I think we can work toward, you know, curbing this surge and, and helping us to, you know, go back to, to a bit of normalcy. So I just want to encourage everyone um, and each one tell one, let us work toward trying to return to some level of normalcy. And we, of course, are in, in, in control of that. So let's follow our protocols. Acting Medical Director there, of course, uh, Dr. Tahisha Don Donald. So let's go across now to Dr. Sean Charles. Doc, go right ahead. All right. I too want to echo some of the sentiments um, given by Dr. Donald. Uh, COVID is going to be around for uh, a long time to come, right? And we have to adapt to live with this virus. We have to work with this virus. We have to educate our children with this virus, right? And this is the new normal. We encourage everyone as part of this new normal, protect yourself by getting vaccinated, all right, if you're eligible and following the protocols that we have been recommending. Wear a mask, you know, maintain physical distance as far as practical, avoid risky, um, you know, gatherings and such. You know, take all the necessary steps, wash and sanitize. Um, if you're sick, please be responsible, you know, uh, isolate yourself, all right? Do everything in your power to ensure that you do not this is disease onto someone and allow it to make to remain longer than is necessary in Grenada. And I think we can, just like we were able to manage and get past the previous wave, we will do the same with this wave, all right? We just have to all come to terms with the fact that, um, you know, this is the new, this is the new reality. And we have to just be a little more responsible in everything that we do, all right, so that we all remain safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, doctors. You've done a fantastic job here tonight in terms of educating all of us. And we want to thank you too for the encouragements and admonitions that you've given to us. Those of you, of course, who've called in this evening, we want to say thank you so very much for your calls. They've been very 
and highly enlightening. It's been an absolute pleasure to be on here hosting this very important program. So until next week, God's willing, with another presentation of Beyond the Headlines. Have a good evening.